I was approached uh, by the Institute of Medicine last year and, and asked to address some issues on, on fish, fisheries and food security. And I, when I first answered the phone, I said, excuse me, but I think you have the wrong person. And I've since learned that we as fishery scientists and fish ecology actually can add a lot to this discussion. I'm going to talk to you about, I'm trying to link fisheries to uh, the Institute of Medicine by talking about what are the dietary recommendations for fish and seafood, shellfish. How much fish production do we have in the U.S. primarily, I will focus on, but also globally. Briefly, what climate change and other productivity can add, and then just a few closing remarks. I'm an avid reader of Science Times, and I never fail to uh, ignore the articles there on nutrition and, and health. And one sees all the time the importance of having fish in one's diet with omega, uh, the value of omega-3s, but also with the health warning of not having too much fish that may have PCBs or uh, or mercury. So rather than go to the New York Times, I went to the uh, arbiters of good nutrition and looked to see what they told us we should be eating. And by and large, the schools of public health, the American Heart Association, the reproductive health professionals, tell, tell us for both adults and children, we should have between 6 and 12 ounces of seafood, preferably fatty fish, and not the top predators each week. So for those of us who like to do math, let's do some back of the envelope calculations here, and let's see what that ends up being. It means that per person, basically, we should be eating anywhere between a little over a quarter to a little less than three quarters of a pound a week. Some of the recommendations also say the more fish you eat, the better. If we do an order of magnitude calculation, that brings us anywhere from approximately 20 to 39 pounds of, uh, of fish per person per year. In the United States, the recent census has told us there's about 315 million people. And if we consume anywhere between 19.5 and 39 pounds per person, then what we need is 6 to 12 um, times 10 to the 9th pounds from U.S. production or from elsewhere. So that is the recommended consumption for the U.S. population. I want to tell you that the most recent statistics produced by uh, NOAA NIMS Fisheries are that the average person is consuming about, a U.S. citizen is consuming about 15 pounds per year, so underneath what, what's recommended. So that's the recommendation, and by and large, that's the recommendation for fish sticks, for fish fillets, not for eating all the bones. So the next question is, how much do we have to have available? How much does that actually mean when we look at the dockside landed values, whole unprocessed fish? So I turn to Eric, who is the seafood manager at Whole Foods in Virginia Beach. And I asked Eric, what kind of ratio do you get? And Eric told me, about 50% of the fillets. So in, uh, from whole weights, he gets about 50% of that. So for every pound, he gets a half a pound. But in fact, you can go to uh, the US and FAO statistics, and you can see what kinds of yields one gets from uh, a whole fish. And you'll note here, skinless fillets are, are things like what you make out of fish, what, what you use to make fish sticks, or the fillets you buy in the supermarket. And edible fish are for those people who are more uh, assiduous in using all of the fish available to them. And this range is depending on the, on the fish, anywhere from 39 to 51 percent usable yield. 
I'm going to be an optimist. I'm going to use 50% for my back of the envelope calculations. Although we could do it species by species. So if we have 6 to 12 billion pounds of processed fish in the round, then we need anywhere between 12 and 24 billion pounds of landed whole fish. What do we have and what are the sources that we have for uh, our domestic harvest? We have the capture fisheries, and the capture fisheries worldwide are the last of the real wild exploitation we have. We don't really use wild agriculture to support our nutritional needs, but we do largely use wild fish. There are two ways we get those wild fish. One is commercial fishermen, and the other is recreational fishermen. The other source is aquaculture. And in aquaculture here, I'm not only using things like uh, catfish farms in Louisiana, I'm also talking about sea farming. So anytime you take a fish from the wild and you modify its um, growth in some way. So let's look at the volume of domestic landings and aquaculture to see, again, order of magnitude. And what you're going to see here in the U.S., we've been running anywhere between 8 and 10 billion pounds of fish landed in round. And in fact, only about 10 percent of the food available to us in the U.S. is coming from our own aquaculture. So largely, we depend on capture fisheries, wild harvest. Now, there was an interesting article about uh, capture fisheries in nature in February 2013. It's a discussion between Dan Pauley and Ray Hilborn and Trevor Branch. And what Ray is, what uh, Dan Pauley was saying was we should look at the catch statistics to evaluate how much catch will be available to us. And that triggered the famous article uh, by Jackson et al which said that we are going to run out of fish by 2048. I fall on the Hillborn and Branch side of the argument, saying that what we should be looking at is the stock assessments and looking to see whether those fish are managed for maximum productivity. These days, maximum productivity is no longer the fish term maximum sustainable yield, but on a precautionary side of that. So we take a little less than the maximum sustainable yield, depending on how good the fisheries, how good the fisheries data are. If fisheries data is not good, then what we do is we take less. We're more precautious. So these are the sources of harvest for the U.S. And you will see the predominant fish that we have in the U.S. is Alaskan pollock. And if we look at this on a regional basis in a, a fish population by fish population basis, we see that pollock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. So we are getting a very good and sustainable harvest of Alaskan pollock. Menhaden is not a fish we eat, at least not one that I will eat. And I have I've gotten close to menhaden. But they are a very important source of um, omega-3s, and they're very important for fish and fish meal to feed uh, other, uh, other uh, sources of food for us. Menhaden are undergoing a change in how they're evaluated. Previously, they were not overfished, and overfishing was not occurring. But the reference points that we're using to evaluate their sustainability have changed because we are now factoring in their value to us as a prey species for other species. And in that case, overfishing is occurring and only slightly. Salmon is our third important, and this is a source of, of harvest by volume, not by value, but by volume. Salmon is the next important, and whether salmon is overfished and whether overfishing is occurring uh, depends very much on which salmon population you're looking at. By and large, Alaskan salmon are not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. But again, it depends 
on a region by region basis. Salmon fisheries in uh, California are, are very much uh, problematic because of changes in potentially climate. And so you see here, depending on uh, where we look and what species we look at, uh, by and large, our fish stocks in the U.S. are well managed and in, in, in good condition. The one we worry about here is overfished, because overfished means you have literally taken the population size down low enough so that you are not maximizing the production for human consumption you could have. Overfishing means that you are fishing too much. If you are not overfished and you are overfishing, you should stop that now. But you are not yet depleting the stocks. At some point, you will. So I worry much more about that uh, column of, of overfished. So what does that give us? All our US landings are 9.9 uh, .9 times 10 to the ninth pounds, 4.5 million metric tons. The reduction fishery, and that is Menhaden, uh, it counts for uh, 1.9 times uh, 10 to the ninth pounds. So it gives us edible fish, and I have a typo there, I'm sorry for that on the metric tons. Uh, the edible fish and seafood landings give us uh, 7.9 times 10 to the ninth pounds, or 3.6 million metric tons. So, does that give us what we need? We're falling short. What about recreational fisheries? Recreational fisheries are fun. They give us our top species is striped bass. The next top species is speckled trout, both of which I love to eat and fish for. But in fact, recreational fish landings does not make up nearly sufficient difference. And our US aquaculture is 1.2 times 10 to the ninth pounds. So let's give us a comparison. What we want to have is um, what we want to have is 12 to 24 times 10 to the ninth pounds, and what in fact we have is 9.3 times 10 to the ninth pounds. So the take-home message here domestically is we are not producing enough fish in the United States to meet the dietary requirements that the Institute of Medicine and other sources recommend for us. We are not producing enough. So if we were to rely on fish from the US only, we do not have food security for our own country, not with what we're currently eating. We could eat other things. We could figure out how to eat menhaden, for example, or other species, so we could add to it. So let's look globally. Let's look at the issue of equity. Same recommendation. If we do, uh, and I've switched over here to mostly to the metric system, our order of magnitude is 9 to 18 kilograms per person per year. At the current global um, census of 7 uh, billion people, that gives us six, 60 to 120 million metric tons per year of food consumption for our fellow citizens of the world. What do we have available? The available landings globally are 148 million metric tons, and you have to be very careful with these global summaries. The statistics coming out of China are not really reliable, and four statistics coming off of Africa not necessarily reliable either. This includes reduction fisheries, things like sardines and oily fishes that are used for fish meal but not usually eaten. The available fresh, frozen, and cured fish is about 127 million metric tons if we believe the statistics. So what is the total amount recommended for consumption? It's between 60 and 120 million metric tons of processed fish or 120 to 240 million metric tons of landed whole fish. So we are barely, barely 
able to meet world needs if things were evenly distributed. Right now, the United States, States through imports, takes about twice of its uh, equivalents in, in fish production worldwide. So where are the sources worldwide? Uh, we see that a worldwide capture harvest is becoming asymptotic, about 80 to 100 million metric tons. And where we see most of the growth is in aquaculture. Both marine and inland aquaculture provide another perhaps uh, 50 uh, million metric tons, with very little coming from, from inland capture. And that component of available sources, I'm afraid, is, is disappearing. Can we get more fish if we manage them better? In that article by uh, uh, Hilborn and Branch, they looked at stock assessments in the major industrialized world where most of your fish production is occurring and where you have your best statistics. And out of 166 stocks that they looked at, 14% were collapsed. And so they could, in fact, bring back uh, better production if you manage those better. But that's only 14%. In this article by Sumeya, which was in, um, I think it was either late last year or early, late last year, you'll see in that top line of catch, oops, in that top line of catch, and we're looking here, how much could you improve that by good management? And that article says that the economic cost versus the benefits will become equal after about 12 years of trying to rebuild. And in fact, what you can gain is maybe, maybe 10%. And that's simply not enough. If we manage better, we'll initially lose a little production to gain it later. But once we gain it, we're not going to have gained back enough to meet our needs. Can we use aquaculture? Worldwide, there's been a real change in aquaculture. You don't have to read this article. But aquaculture is starting to grow so that it can potentially top 60% of food production. And the projections here are you're seeing that the capture fisheries are not increasing, but the worldwide potential for aquaculture is. And this is largely aquaculture in Asia. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we can expect from climate change and how climate change is going to affect potential uh, food sources for us. And in The Guardian on September 2012, they estimated that fish would shrink by up to a quarter. And this is fish size. This is not fish uh, landings. This is fish size. But with smaller size fish, for many reasons, uh, including over-harvest, including climate change, including change in biodiversity. What you will see is change in the amount that you can get for, for food. And this is MSC, uh, the uh, Marine Stewardship Council, discussing that very same issue about the effects of climate change on sustainable fisheries. And climate change has a lot of components. You not only change in number and in quality, so you're changing species, some of which you may not want to eat, some of which may not be so good to eat, but you're also changing things like fish distribution, you're changing fish physiology, you're changing the seasonality of when they move, you may in fact disconnect them from their food supply, you change the predators. So. Let's talk about specifics. We've been studying Atlantic menhaden, which is a prime uh, prey source and in the reduction fishery. And you can see that there's been a steady decline. Now, this can be attributed to uh, overfishing, but we're also seeing some changes in distribution of the nursery grounds. 
of Atlantic Menhaden that may in fact be a product of either climate change or anthropogenic changes. We also see a change in fish range. I've chosen here Atlantic croaker. Atlantic croaker used to never get much beyond uh, Delaware Bay, and now we have spawning populations in New Jersey, and they're venturing further north. There are other species that are uh, in the co-genus with the co-family of Atlantic croaker, and you would also expect them to be moving north. Some are, some aren't. And so who moves north with climate change isn't easily predictable. Finally, what's happening? I said that spotted sea trout were the second most important recreational species in the US. They rely very heavily on our seagrass productivity as their nursery grounds. And we're seeing historic lows in seagrass habitats and the question is, if we have no nursery habitats, we will have no fish. So my conclusions. The US dietary suggestions may, in fact, exceed our, our current US domestic food production. And will changes in management and aquaculture bridge the gap? We will need a lot of work to be able to bridge that gap. Management, I don't think so. I think we can up and get more sustainable production, but not by enough. Aquaculture, potentially, but remember there are also hazards to aquaculture. And unknown are the effects of climate change on, on fish production. So if I were to reword my talk, I would probably say there's not enough fish in the sea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was uh, certainly a very definitive conclusion. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, if you can, again, as before, if we can keep questions to the question and answer session uh, for the panel that will follow the, this third speaker. Uh, the third speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Frank uh, Meltner from University of California, Davis. Um, he is Associate Professor and Air Quality Specialist at the, uh, and also works in the uh, Cooperative Extension Service. Dr. Miltner's, uh, or Mittelowner, I'm sure, I think I got your name wrong. Uh, his talk will be on trade-offs between human and environmental health, focusing on meats. <laughs>